You're most welcome to Acacia Community Church today. <laughs> I'm here with Pastor Brian and Matthew as our worship leader. And we're excited that we're going to be singing some great songs together today and, and hearing the word after that. And so I just want us to pray and we will jump right into worshiping the Lord in song and in the word of God together. So shall we pray? Father, we bow down before you this evening and say thank you for the great love you have for us. And just thank you for reminding us that we need you each and every day of our lives. And even as we sing this song and other songs after that, that it will encourage us, remind us of your love, remind us of how much we need you, but above it all of the, the sacrifice you made for us on the cross to bring us close to you, make us your family, your children. That, that's the awesome news that puts smiles on our faces, and I pray it does on the faces of many others as well, all for your glory. In Jesus' name.
courage of the love of God. And even as we sing this next song, I hope it continues speaking to you, encouraging you, but above it all, reminding you of the great love that our Father has towards you, towards everyone. Be encouraged, reminded today that it does not matter how far you think you've gone, His love will reach you. His grace is sufficient. Took a breath, you breathe your life for me. You have been so, so kind to me. And know the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, riches.
father, we say thank you. Thank you for such a great love, a love that you've given to us. That was evidence that while we were still dead and lost in our sins and transgressions, that you proved that love and made your son Jesus Christ to die, to die on the cross for my sin, for our sin. sink in today in our hearts. Let that remind us today. And let that compel us, Lord, to move on and share the same love with those who need it, those who are longing for it, those who are looking for it. And as we do that, let it all be for your glory and glory alone. And thank you for your word as we read, as we share just in a moment. Continue using it to speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Well, I'll invite you to open your Bible, if you have not already done that, uh, to First Peter chapter 2. We're going to take a reading from verse 18, uh, and we'll go through to verse 25. So First Peter, please, if you do that, it will be great. First Peter, I'll take a reading from ESV, and this is what it says. Servants. Be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if you, when you do good, and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued and trusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins on his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now, I, I hope you've been following. We are preaching through First Peter. And... and it's this this passage is so deep it's so rich uh, with with truth for us today and if you've seen the title the title is doing the right thing even when it hurts doing the right thing even when it hurts and and, and that's not easy i want to say that up front it's not easy to do the right thing it's not easy to continue doing the right thing when you're hurting when you're unjustly being persecuted but just reading this passage that the benchmark that what the bible calls us to he says look to jesus he set for you an example but in these verses we've just read we're going to look at why we can and why we should continue doing the right thing even when it's hurt even when it's hurting even when you feel it's unjust for you to go through what you're going through. There's something in this passage that we've just read that, that motivates, that encourages us. And, and just looking at verse 18, the reason why we can do the right thing and we should do the right thing even when it hurts is this. We can do it because there are always going to be unjust people around us. So look at what it says in verse 8. It says, servants, it says, be subject to your masters in all respect, not only to the good and the gentle, but even to the unjust. And just, of course, here is directly bringing that relationship that exists, that should exist between 
the servant and their masters or employee and employee, but just looking in general as believers as we live and walk this life, the reality is there are always going to be people who are unjust. There are always going to be people who are unkind. People who are going to want to take advantage of you or who, because of your faith, will either persecute you or not value or treat you the way you should be treated as a believer. And, and, and knowing that up front helps us or should help us understand what the Bible is saying. And so the call is to say, be subject to your masses in all respects. Remember the, the verses before that was a general call given to all of us as believers to be subjects, to be submissive to the authorities that we have above us. And, and the reason is, looking at the verses before that, the reason is because... Jesus Christ, because we want to honor our Savior, because we want to glorify Him in our lives. And so why can we do the right thing? Why should we constantly do that? Because when God has called us to honor Him and live for Him, but also knowing that there are always going to be those kind of people who don't value others, who don't see truth, who don't want Christ, and therefore are opposing the things of Christ. And, and if that's the case, then I want to tell you up front, as a believer, you need to know up front you will be persecuted. There's something that Apostle Paul said to Timothy. He says, all those who desire... To live a godly life will be persecuted. We need to know that up front. Persecution will come and you will be treated unjustly. It, it's going to hurt to do the right thing. It's going to be painful. You might require to, you might require to make a sacrifice. But don't stop doing the right thing because God has called you to do that. And the second thing we see in verse 19 following why can we do the right thing? Why should we do the right thing? It's because we are mindful of God. And that is very important. So in verse 19 it says, For this is a gracious thing. When what? When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering. Right? So of course, I've already mentioned that there's going to be suffering. You're going to be persecuted for your faith. You're going to be persecuted for doing the right thing. For standing for the right thing. For speaking the truth. For Standing for what honors God and making up your mind to do that, you'll be persecuted. You might lose friends. You might actually be tossed by all those who were close to you for saying, I have made my mind to follow Christ and not just follow Christ, but to live for Him and Him alone. That's going to bring persecution. And he says, it's a gracious thing when what? He says, when we are mindful of God. You see right there what is going to help us, strengthen us, encourage us, build us, and push us one step at a time to doing con constantly doing the right thing as we journey in this life as believers is when we are mindful of God. That's what he's saying. So the question is, where is God in your life, in your priorities, in your plans, in the decisions you make? Where is God involved? As you, as you deal with probably the, the persecution you're facing or the unjust treatment you, you might be experiencing, where is God in that? Are you still mindful of God? Are you still, as a believer, as an individual, saying, well, I am a son of God, I'm a daughter of God, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to do this, the right thing. I'm going to stand for the truth. I'm going to continue believing, continue trusting, continue serving, not because of them, not because they deserve it, but because my master and savior, Jesus Christ, has saved me and has called me, and I want to glorify him with my life and everything I'm doing. It says, when mindful of God. And that's very important. We need to be mindful of God. And, and that, that literally means we need to ask ourselves constantly as we make these decisions, as we face life, as we go about our businesses on a daily basis. There's this. Bring glory to God. Is God pleased with this action I'm taking? Is God pleased with the choice I'm making right now? Is God pleased with the response I'm giving right now? When we are mindful of God, it helps us to continue 
doing the right thing to continue trusting him, honoring him, serving him, and serving others. Because we are mindful of him. Because at the end of it all, we are doing it for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Not for those people. We are doing it because God has called us to do it. Not because those people deserve it. Because the truth is, we don't even deserve his love. We don't deserve it. That, that's that song we sang the last one, the, the reckless love of God. We, we don't deserve it. We're encouraged. We don't deserve it. We could not earn it in any way possible. Even if we were to give everything we have, even if we were to give everything the world had, would not be enough to just save one person. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. And, and that, and yet Christ loved us. And yet God sent his son who died for us. So he says, we need to be mindful of him. So he says, when mindful of God, is, look at what he says, it's a gracious thing. Just, just, just imagine that. It, you both receive, you receive the grace of, grace of God, but this is what happens. People who are watching you begins experiencing the grace of God that is in your life, but is now being spread. They're seeing the grace of God at work in your life, but they're beginning to experience it as well. It's a gracious thing. So he says, we need to be mindful of God. The third thing, why we do the right thing, why we're being called to do the right thing at all times, even when it hurts. It's because it is a gracious thing. Right? It's a gracious thing before God. That's what he's saying. Before God. So he says, for what credit? For, for just look at that. For what credit? It's a question. For what credit is it? If, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure, right? When you sin, you're going to be beaten, you're going to be punished for it, and you're going to endure the pain and the punishment. Of what credit is that to you? So you've committed a crime, you've, you've, you've disobeyed, you've broken the law, you've sinned, you've done all of, all of those, and therefore, as a result of that, you are being punished. There's a consequence for it. So it's, of what benefit is that to you? You're enduring the pain. But it says, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. Look at what it says. It is, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So look at what it's saying. It's saying, if persecution is going to come, it is going to come. It's going to come. And it says, let us suffer. If we're going to suffer, if it's God's will for us to suffer, let it be for doing the right thing. That's what it's saying. Because if you are doing the wrong thing, you will suffer for it. You will be punished for it. But if we are going to suffer, let us suffer for doing the right thing. Let that persecution come. Because we are doing the right thing. Because we are doing the things of God, serving God, ministering to God's people, proclaiming the word of God, and without apology. Let it be. That, if you're suffering, if you're per being persecuted, if you are going to go through these things, let it be you're facing it because you have stood your ground as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, and said, no, I'm not going to back away. I'm not going to be still. I'm not going to be silent on that because the Bible says this and this and this. And on the truth of the word of God, I stand. And that is my authority. I'm not going to change it. Let it be that. And so someone will hate you if someone is hating you for speaking the truth to them. Let it be so. Let us not suffer. Let us not go through all the pains and the hurt. Because we were caught on the wrong side of the law. Because we were doing something wrong. So he asked the question, of what credit is that to you? There's no credit. There's nothing out of it. But for doing the right thing, one, you are even going through that, proclaiming the gospel. Your testimony is that being a good witness to the watching world. But he says, it's a gracious thing. It's bringing glory to God. And people are knowing there is something more to this person than meets the eye. There's something more to the truth they hold than meets the eye. And that's what was said about the disciples. When you read in the book of Acts, 
because they were persecuted greatly. And, and there's something that the Pharisees and those who were persecuting them say. They say, you see, there, many people have come over the years and claimed to be great, but when they are gone, their disciples disappear. But this Jesus Christ of Nazareth has been here and he's gone, but his disciples have still remained. They're still persistent. They're still growing. They're continuing. They're being tortured. They're being beaten. They're being persecuted, but they're not backing away. There has to be something more to what they're saying than we are realizing. There has to be truth to the gospel they're proclaiming about Jesus than we are willing to admit. Because if there was no Jesus, if this man was just one of those many, these guys would have scattered, but they're willing to die for him. They're being persecuted. They're being thrown in prison. They're being warned over and over again, but they're standing their ground and preaching. There has to be something. And God, Gamaliel said, Guys, let's be careful. We might be fighting God himself. Where did that come from? It came out of the boldness of the disciples, the commitment that the disciples had made, the standard taken and said, if you're going to persecute us for preaching Christ, for doing the right thing, for standing on the truth, so be it. But we are not going to stop proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ because there is no name given among men by which we must be saved except one name, the name of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible is saying here. Guys, if there's going to be any persecution, if you are going to face persecution as a believer, let it be because you have stood your ground to proclaim the gospel, to speak about Jesus Christ, and they don't want to hear it. Don't ever let it be because you were caught fighting, you were caught stealing, you were, you were breaking into someone's shop, breaking into someone's home, and of what credit is that to you? There's no credit in that. Worst of all, it brings shame. It brings shame to the body of Christ. Says, let us be mindful of God and endure that. We continue. In verse 21, looking at the first reason why we're being called to do the right thing even when it hurts. It's because Jesus Christ left for us an example to follow. That's big, guys. That's huge. So in verse 21, it says, For to this you have been called. To what? To suffering. If there's going to be suffering, it says that that's what's coming. That's what's, what's coming on our way is we have been called to stand for the truth, preach the truth, and therefore, if suffering and persecution is going to come for the truth, that's what you've been called to do. It's going to come that way. It says, for this you've been called because, why? Jesus Christ also suffered for you. So Jesus Christ suffered for you. Now, if you want to know more about the suffering of Christ, go and read the gospel. Read the gospel and you look at Everything Jesus Christ went through, suffering experience, being beaten, being tortured, being made to wear a crown of thorns and nailed on the cross. He says, he did that for us. But look at what, why he did that. He said, leaving for you and leaving for me, leaving for us an example so that we might follow in his steps. And now the verses the father was 22 and 23 and 4 is going to give description of this example that he set for us for us to follow so he says what example did jesus christ leave for us one he said he committed no sin neither was deceit found in his mouth so that that right there so Already we're being told and reminded of the innocence of Christ. And we're being told, even though there was no sin, there was no deceit, there was no crime at all, he was still persecuted. So he suffered, not because he deserved it, but his suffering brought glory to God. And that's what he said in verse 21. And in verse 20, he said, when we are mindful of God and we suffer for the truth, for the right thing, he says, it brings glory to God. And it's a gracious thing before you sign. So Jesus Christ did not commit any, but he suffered for your sin and my sin. But look also what it says. He was reviled, but he did not revile back. 
Now, look at, we're looking at the example of this left for us. We, we're told we can and should continue doing the right thing even when it's hurt because Jesus Christ has left for us an example. And now we're looking at it here. One, one, he did not commit any crime even though he suffered for it. Okay? But it says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Okay? Just think about that for a moment. This is a man with all the power and authority in heaven and on earth. Sinless, innocent, pure, holy, righteous before God. It's being reviled. And he does not say anything and he does not do anything. The Bible says that's the example is left for us to follow. That if that suffering if that persecution is going to come your way for doing the right thing, you remain, keep that position, keep trusting in God, keep that faith, and don't back away. And he says, he continues, he, when he suffered, when Jesus Christ suffered, another example, he did not threaten. And, and we hear that a lot today. You were doing that to me, you wait until I can get you. Pray hard that I don't find you. We're told that Jesus Christ did not even threaten. And yet he had all the powers. He could have just done this and, and everything would, would have, you know, gone south. But he did not threaten. And that's the example the Bible is calling us to emulate as we live in and on this world, as we journey through this earth as believers, as we proclaim the gospel. And remember, I've already said this over and over and over again, that the gospel is proclaimed not just by the words that come out of our mouth, but the life that we live. We've been called to live the gospel, not speak it only. He continues. So what did he do? He was reviled, he did not revile back in return. He was he suffered and he did not threaten. But what did he do? He trusted. He continued trusting. He continued trusting. Look at that. Trusting. That brings us to the next thing. What do we do? How do we live? How do we continue doing this? journeying this earth, doing the right thing with no appreciation, with pain, with persecution, with suffering directed our way as believers. We trust in God who judges justly. That's what we should do. We can do it. We can continue because we trust in the God. The one and only God who judges justly. So it says, looking, again, picking from Jesus, what did he do? He continued trusting himself. To him, who? God, who judges justly. Trust him, guys. You can trust him. And with him, there's no partiality. With him, there's no bribe. God is not bribed. He cannot be bought. When God says yes, it's a yes. And with him, all his promises are yes and amen. You can trust him. That's why he says we can do the right thing. We can continue. He himself, Jesus Christ, bore our sins in his body on the tree. And why did he do that? So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Now look at this. Do you, do you see the reason why we can continue doing the right thing even when it hurts? Because we died to sin and we've been raised to live a life, a new life in righteousness. And this life that we live, it's not us living, but Christ who lives in us. It's not by our strength and ability. You see the reason why Christ died and now the example you said we can follow and we've been called to follow? It's because he died to sin and he died so that we can die to sin, which, which comes with all of its desires and, and selfish nature and, and the revengeful spirit attitude and payback attitude. And he said so that we can live in righteousness which is live for God and God alone. That's what happens. And then we see the last thing. And so, of course, it says, by his wounds you've been healed. Healed from what? From the atrocities, the, the pain, the hurt, the wounds, and everything that sin had brought 
including healing the relationship that was broken and destroyed by sin, the relationship between us and God. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it as, as white as snow. Then we see the last thing here, why we can continue doing the right thing even when it's hard. It's because the Lord watches over us. It's because the Lord watches over us. So he says, of course, for you were like sheep, straying. You were going astray. That's what he's saying. We were going astray. But what has happened? But you have now returned. Look at what he says. To the shepherd and overseer of our souls, of your souls. We, we have someone who watches over us. He says, he's the shepherd, so he takes care of us. He's the one who feeds us, he's the one who guides us, he's the one who protects us. But all he says is overseer. He's the one who is doing the overwatch, which is dealing with protection, dealing with guidance, dealing with safety that we have. So he says, he's the one who's watching over us. So we can trust him, so we can rely on him, so we can live for him and him alone. So guys, it's, it's true that it's heard. And the truth is, it's not easy. And left for us alone, we cannot do this. But the good news is, we have not been called to do this alone. We have not been called to walk this life alone. God has given us His Spirit who indwells us. You see, we can have hope that things will be better. We can have hope of a new day tomorrow because hope does not disappoint us. Why do I say that? Because God has poured His love into our hearts through His Holy Spirit. Who resides in each and every one of us. And it's through Him that we can call Him Father. I want to call you this evening. If you've not confessed Him, if you've not believed Him as your Lord and Savior, if you've not invited Him in your heart, today's the day and now is the time. You need Jesus. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Receive him today. And please send us a message and, and let us know. I encourage you, if you have a question about how you can begin a journey with Jesus Christ, or a question from the Bible, and we'll be willing to show you and point you to the right direction. But for my brothers and sisters who are already in Christ, be encouraged that you, you are not alone. That there's no mountain the Lord will not climb. There's no valley he's not going to get to to reach you. He's proven his love for you and I while we were still dead and lost. If he made his son die for us while we were still sinners, his enemies. How about now that we belong to him? Now that we're his children. Let that encourage you today to live for him, to con constantly do the right thing, and let's be mindful of him so that we live for his glory, so that even the persecution you might experience itself, the way you face it, becomes a testimony that brings someone to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Father, we say thank you for loving us. Thank you. And God, I pray for each and every one of us. It's true that it's not easy to constantly do the right thing. That you've called us to live for you. You've left for us an example, Lord. And I pray that you help us follow in your footsteps. You help us be mindful of you. You help us live for you and you, Lord. Constantly trusting you. Being encouraged and reminded that you are our shepherd. You are the one who is overseeing and watching over us. Help us live for your glory and may this truth speak to someone today. We praise and we honor you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. I pray you have a great remaining rest of the week. And I'll see you on Sunday at 11 a.m. as we continue studying the book of Acts together. God bless you.